Hi, everyone, and welcome again to another one of my Gaudium at Spes22.com Podbean podcasts and YouTube videos. Uh, I'm joined today by someone for most of you needs no introduction, but in case you don't know who is, it's it's Robert Royal. Thank you, uh, Bob, for showing up today and taking the time to, to meet with me. My pleasure, Larry. And for those who don't know, he's editor in chief of The Catholic Thing, for which I've written a few things now and then. He's also president of Faith, uh, the Faith and Reason Institute in Washington, D.C., author of many, many things and books and so on. Uh, but before we get started, I do want to plug one of your books that I really like. Uh, it's uh, called A Deeper Vision right here, The Catholic Intellectual Tradition in the 20th Century. Uh, I've returned to it over and over. This is really a great book, and uh, I, I highly recommend my view. It's from Ignatius Press, so Father Fessy will be happy that I'm plugging Ignatius Press. But it's a great book, and it really is a broad overview of the history of 20th century Catholic theology. I think somebody else that writes beautifully on that is Tracy Rowland, uh, and, and you and she sort of think in very, very similar similar pathways. But for those viewers who are always wanting me to recommend books on the history of theology, Vatican II, which gets a focus in here, I would like to recommend Robert Royal's book, A Deeper Vision, The Catholic Intellectual Tradition in the 20th Century. How old is this book now? I've had it for a while. Yeah, it's, it's six or seven years old, and I'm actually writing a sequel to it because that book is mostly focused on European figures yeah, uh, who, of course, were, were central to a lot of what happened in the 20th century. But I want to do a, 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 a kind of a sequel, not a, a strict sequel, but a kind of a sequel about our American Catholic intellectual tradition, which is a lot richer than most people actually realize. Um, you know, we, we think we had these big media figures like Fulton Sheen and Thomas Merton, of course, was a big figure at one point. But there's a lot of, of other things that are going on in the United States. And, you know, we've got great writers like Flannery O'Connor and Walker Percy, et cetera. So um, I've got hundreds of pages written on this. Um, I'm hoping that when this synodal stuff is past us, I'll have a chance to put it all together. <laughs> but, you know, I'm glad you like that book because it's my favorite. I don't think I can write better. Than that, and I gave a copy of it to Cardinal Mueller two, three years ago, and I, I handed it to him and I said, "Look, I want you to understand because some people who are friends of mine and basically agree with what the kind of thing that I say are a little bit shocked that I'm, I'm kind of doing a survey." And I said, "What I wanted to do was not write a polemical book. I wanted to. Mo I mean, you can't yeah. help but take certain positions, but I mostly wanted to write a descriptive book so that people could then, you know, look at." literature, art, history, scripture studies, philosophy, theology, and then go read into it themselves. And he looked at me and with that grand Teutonic way that he has. He's a very big man, as you know. Yes, yes. And he said, oh, a non-polemical book. That is a rarity these days. <laughs> <laughs> and it is non-polemical. That's really what I, I love about it. <clears throat> it could be used as a textbook. Quite easily, I'm assuming and has, that it has been. Yeah, I, I was going to say it probably has been. Uh, and so anybody that's out there who teaches college level uh, theology courses and you want a great book uh, uh, from a, a very traditional Catholic perspective, uh, surveying the 20th century Catholic theology, that's the book for you, A Deeper Vision uh, by Robert Royal. And the other thing is it's very clearly written. It's very well written. Uh, and I think which makes it very accessible, I think, to most educated Catholics. Uh, some of the terminology would be a little dicey for some of them. But, you know, it's it's a very, very readable text and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Unfortunately, it's all marked up. Uh, I have this nasty habit of underlining everything that I like. And I ended up underlining three fourths of the book, which <laughs> makes the underlying almost useless. <laughs> <laughs> I do that, too. <laughs> so anyway, we're here today, today uh, to talk about a couple of things. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is um, the Instrumentum Laboris, as it's called, which is the sort of working document for the upcoming Synod on Synodality, which will begin in October this fall, the second session, the final session, I hope. Uh, and uh, this document, the Instrumentum Laboris, was put out a couple of weeks ago. Before I turn to you, uh, Robert, I, I want to say that my initial reaction to it, I read it quickly. I got a, I got an email from Jonathan Liedel at the National Catholic Register, and he says, Larry, I'm writing an article, an instrument. I want to get the opinion of various theologians. Can you be one of them? I said, sure. But he says, you got to have it to me within like a day and a half. So I quickly read through the instrument in Laboris, and it's, you know, long. Uh, 
and I, it was a very quick read. And my initial impression was positive because my initial impression was, well, geez, it doesn't bring up LGBTQ. It doesn't bring up women's ordination. It's shying away from all the hot button issues. It's actually focusing on the nature of synodality. It even pays homage to us to a certain uh, ecclesiology of communion. I thought so. I thought, hey, not bad, not bad. So I, I my comments in the register were very positive. And it's like, but I think I've read it now th three times in total. And I think my, my initial impression was positive simply because I'm so used to lousy documents coming out of this Vatican. Then when one came out that wasn't riddled with ambiguities and errors, at least it seemed to me at the time, you know, it's, it's the point where because it wasn't horrible, I thought it was good. <laughs> but, you know, after a second and third reading, I actually think it has major problems. Uh, and I want to talk about those with you today and as well as maybe its strengths. But anyway, I'll turn it over to you. What are your and, and I, I would also ask my viewers, you know, I know that you discussed this. You mentioned to me off camera on EWTN, I think last week with Raymond Arroyo and Father Murray. Uh, so I'm sure that's probably accessible on YouTube if people wanted to go watch that too. But anyway, so go ahead, uh, Bob, tell us your thoughts on the instrumentum laboris. Well, I mean, look, as a kind of a general reaction uh, to what you just said, if this document had come out in the papacy of John Paul II or Benedict XVI, I, I don't think any of us would be extremely upset about it. Uh, there, There is this tangle. I mean, there's, there's this kind of rhetorical thick thicket of what, synod, this, what the synodality even is. And you know, that is a problem. But I I think if somebody else, if we has had somebody who we really trusted with a, a process like this, we wouldn't be as, as worried about it. The difficulty for me is that um, I think it, it kind of goes back to, to the Pope's often repeated principle that reality is greater than ideas, which, of course, is itself an idea. So if we if we can't use <laughs> yeah. ideas, we can't even express <laughs> that, that reality is greater yeah. than ideas. But see, part of the problem, it seems to me, about the whole process of synodality is that it is a process, that it isn't a thing. They don't want to point to and say, look, we've got a definition. In fact, the other day, the Pope gave a lecture in which he said, if we're going to only use clear and distinct ideas, I think he was having an anti-Cartesian moment, perhaps, at the moment, that we're going to limit ourselves and, and that we need to open ourselves up to a greater reality. And that's that's perfectly fine. But it just seems to me that there are obsessive elements in this that worry me. The, the, the way listening appears multiple times on every page, the way that the return to the inclusion of women almost seems to be a kind of a, a, an obsession or a, an insistence that something, in fact, it actually says in section 71, if there isn't a change in as a result of these conversations, a lot of people who's I, these are my words now. Expectations have been raised are going to be deeply disappointed. Well, this is very weird. In other words, we've raised expectations, so we better deliver on them, whether it's a good idea, because what's supposed to come out of this is, is the result of these conversations. And yet, in spite of the fact that synodality is supposed to be all of us in, in conversation, that isn't what always happens. And one of the reasons why, as you rightly point out, LGBT and women's ordination is not in the document is that they've been postponed. So I don't think it's going to end in October of 2024. They've been postponed because there are 10, as you, as you know, study groups that are working on those most more difficult issues that are going to re return with reports to the Holy Father next June, June, 2025. And, and presumably that too is going to have to be brought into the mix. So we're very far from the end. And, um, the loose ends and even the, the, the central con contentions, it seems to me, affirm some good things, but they also can be interpreted in, in, the, in an opposite way. And so we don't have clear and distinct ideas. What we have is the tangle of synodality. I, I couldn't have put it better myself, uh, you know, that it, it's, there's an element of mistrust here. And I think it's an element that's earned and deserved. Uh, because of various things. One looks, for example, at the destruction of the JP2 Institute in Rome under this Pope, the destruction of the Pontifical Academy for Life in Rome under this Pope, the promotion of 
uh, Cardinals Hollerick and Maparoya and Father James Martin in letters to Sister Gramic, uh, emphasizing, you know, the importance of their ministries and LGBTQ issues and so on, and ambiguities in Amoris Laetitia and, and on and on and on and on. So that when you read this document, as I did initially, it's like, wow, OK, it, it doesn't play in that sandbox so much. So I'm happy with it. And yet you're absolutely right. Uh, when I when I read it a second time, what struck me was this dense thicket, as I think you called it, this dense thicket of verbosity uh, that keeps mentioning, listening and listening and listening and so on. And you're right. There are all these study groups now. And uh, I think I, you would I, the name escapes me right now. But there is a, a priest who's been appointed to the one study group studying controversial issues who has said that homosexual acts might, in fact, be moral under certain circumstances. Yeah, his name is Kyogi, which, which, yeah. which, yeah, which ironically means nail, like, you know, a hammer and nail in Italian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and so, you know, why why choose him? You know, why, why put yeah, him well, on see, there? See, this is the kind of thing that, of course, get, gets us all really going, because we're, we're supposed to be listening, 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 and the Pope is supposed to be learning how to exercise the Petrine ministry. And actually, the document says at one point, this is going to give us the true understanding of the hierarchical, pyramidal, I think they use pyramidal uh, church. And does it? Because what, what we see is when, uh, to, to take even Amoris Laetitia, when the Holy Father didn't get from the Synodal Fathers what he wanted, he made sure he was, he began to set in motion other things that would give him uh, give him opportunities and redefine things and you're, you're not really being synodal when you appoint some dissenting theologians to study groups and those stu that particular study group that he he's going to be in is about sensitive pastoral uh, theological doctrinal and ethical issues so we know what that means it's going to be the lgbt yeah yeah it's just agenda. code for that yes and 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 you know it it doesn't end there. I you know you and I have both uh, taught university students, and my impression as I was going through this with all this listening is first of all, well, don't we have anything to? Doesn't the church have anything to tell people? I, I, I look back to the the synod on on youth. I don't know if you were at that one, but I was there for the, no, the whole. No, thing. I wasn't there. And actually, it was at the synod at youth in 2018. I think it was. It was before COVID that this term synodality suddenly appeared out of nowhere at the end of the synod in the, in the report document. And it, it had not been discussed but internally to the synod. And meanwhile, the young people were there and they were great. I, I really liked the people that, that showed up, the young people for that, that synod to discuss with, discuss with the synod fathers. And you heard over and over from them again, we want to be formed. We want to be instructed. And the, hierarchy and the 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 uh, organizers and the administrators of the center were sort of we're listening to you you know we're listening to you so th this whole question of listening you know we both as i started to say we both have taught you know, at the university level and yeah yeah th this repetition started to remind me of you know that bad student that you have when you you signed a 30 page paper this, for at least happily this is only 30 pages and after five pages you're reading into it and you say this guy's got nothing more to say he's going to run out of gas and he's going to repeat these things over and over again and I, I think that shows that that, that in a, a process that is trying to enlarge things, that, that whose stated um, aim is to be a church, a, a synodal church in mission, there actually are a limited number of subjects that seem to be addressed here. And that set up a red flag for me. Yeah. Uh, and and the, the constant... You know, that, that brings me, you know, in, in terms of this emphasis on listening, 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 which seems to me, once again, to simply be code, code for we're going to keep this conversation going until we hear and cure in a curated way what we want to hear so that this this word listening, listening is is, is code for a certain stalking horse to make changes in doctrines through an unending pointless conversation. So Pope Francis gives this interview to 60 Minutes, right? And the, the interviewer asks him point blank, will women be ordained to holy orders? No, no. All right. And now, once again, we're ha we have another commission on the female diaconate. I mean, is, is, isn't that accurate? I mean, isn't, isn't that one of the study groups, once again, to study? I mean, and, and what is this, the fifth, sixth, seventh? 
time the Pope has started a study group on the female diaconate? Why do that if his definitive no really is a definitive no? That's my question. Well, look, I don't claim to understand this Pope, so I'm going to just try to speculate a little bit about what I, I think he's he, he's doing. I think he really wants much larger changes, but he is pastoral enough uh, on some issues. Latin Mass is a different story. He's, he, he seems to be just have the knives out for that. But he's pastoral enough on some issues that he knows that if there's too much of a shock, people are really going to revolt. And we know that in Fiducia Supplicans, um, there immediately was that that reaction against blessing gay couples, and it is said in several places, couples, not individuals, as they've been saying yeah. since. Yeah. But my speculation, this is the only thing that, that after years of puzzlement of, of trying to follow this papacy, I covered on EWTN with Father Murray, Father Landry, and Raymond Royal the election of the Pope in 2013. Um, my, my, only, my only way of understanding what he's trying to do here is He's going to try, I believe, and, and there have been some statements to this effect. He's going to try to find a non-ordination ordination, if I can put it that way. It's, in yeah. other words, it's not going to be ordination to orders the way, you know, the, the, toward the priesthood, the way that, uh, technically that's been the case inside the church. I think he's going to find a, a kind of a para status for women deacons. And at, at least initially, it may not even be called deaconesses. It may be called, you know, I don't know, pastoral, female pastoral assistance or something. I mean, but that's going to be his way to, to get the camel's nose under the tent, so to speak. And then he's going to hope that, you know, further down the line, things will evolve further in a way that doesn't cause a tremendous explosion in the church. But, you know, one of the questions that always come, comes up in my mind when I see this emphasis on women, and boy, women is are on, like listening, are on, on almost every page. So if the two main categories of people we're supposed to be listening to are women and gays, LGBTs, why only them? All right, those two are from the secular society. Those are the, the two groups yeah. that are developed Western societies look to as needing to be affirmed positively. But why not pick Blacks? Why not pick Africans? You know, the African, the African church is the fastest growing church in the world. It produces enormous numbers by our standards of, um, of um, priests, some, some of whom end up in the West helping out. So they, they've got vocations. They've got a dynamism. They, of course, strongly resisted fiducia supplicans and i i think that the vatican kind of dismissively and maybe almost racial racistly um said that well it's not in their culture to to tolerate yeah. this yeah but why why not them i mean they're they're marginalized why not the why not the asians who also tend to be more traditional so you know we're we're hearing people who allegedly are not um have been marginalized and you know they haven't had an influence they don't have power as, as the discourse goes yeah but we, we're selective about who and i think you're right about it you know we're selecting who we're going to listen to till we get the answer to it yes it's, it's a, a curated listening and uh, you know i think you know you sort of answered your own question there i you know the, why aren't we listening to the africans we're not listening because we don't really want to hear what they have to say because we're not we know we're not going to like what they have to say uh, where these others and and the other groups that they are listening to, like you said, it's it's prioritizing them is is the same priority as you see in the secular world. So it's kind of aping uh, the concerns of the secular left uh, in Western culture, uh, which you know it, how 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 peripheral are these groups? In other words, we're always we're talking about listening to people who are on the margins or on the peripheries. How how marginal and peripheral are they really in modern yeah. Western culture? You know, you know, and the other thing I think I'd like to add is it, just not to be misunderstood about the women's thing. I mean, I have no objection to women occupying roles that are proper for non-ordained people, even yeah, in right. Vatican, you know, wherever it might be. But as with we see with kind of this affirmative action run wild in the secular society. I don't want simply women because they're women. I certainly don't want gays because they're gay in, in positions in the church. Yeah. What I want are the people who really are the best persons, have the best skills, 
um, for the subject matter, for working with other people, for you know helping the Vatican to to uh, evangelize, to use whatever office they have to advance the the mission of of Christ's Church in the world. Those are the people we want, whether they're male or female, you know, et cetera. And to to ape that secular language, I think, is to put us down in that, you know, we're, we're not getting the best people. We're getting the the ideologically correct people. Yeah, I agree. I agree completely. And and that's why I think a lot of us, you know, we look at the Senate and it's, it's, you don't want to be cynical. And I mean, he is the Holy Father. Uh, but is this a stalking horse for, for something else? Uh, and that's that's the phrase that just keeps burning through my brain, that this is really not about synodality as such a less centralized church. There's all the re in other words, there's a reason why we want a less centralized church, because the less centralized the church is, then the, the, the greater the possibility will be that we can enact all of these changes that we want to enact without an, a heavy handed Roman authority overseeing everything. Maybe the Germans can go their way and the Canadians can go their way and so on. Let the Africans do their thing when the Germans will do their thing. So I, I, in other words, I'm calling into question whether or not synod, the, the synod on synodality really, really is about synodality. Yeah, I think that's I think that's right. I mean, look, it certainly has gained the Holy Father a lot of credibility with with the secular world. But yeah. at what price? You know, I, I mean, we have to say at what price, because he's also said some very powerfully some other things that the secular world doesn't magnify, of course. I mean, we've never had a pope say, for example, that abortion is like hiring a hitman to, to resolve a problem. That is a remarkably stark way to talk about abortion. And I think if a lot of people were more aware that he's spoken in those terms about something like ab abortion, which is hotly contested here in America and, and Europe and uh, elsewhere, it would give them a, a very different look at, at who he is. And then, you know, on top of all this other stuff that he does, with, you know, listening to women, to LGBT and whatnot, he comes out and he says that the gender ideology is is a form of colonialism, right. that the West is imposing this yeah. on other people. So, look, we, you know, we, to go back to this, we can never entirely square these circles with him. I, I often remember a remark he made to someone who asked him about what Argentinians were like. And he said, oh, he said, you have to be very careful with the Argentinians. They say one thing. They th they do a second and they think a third. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of an yeah. autobiographical uh, confession in, in, in one I, sense. I, I think, and in his case, I, I think I think it's true. Uh, anyway, so back to the instrumentum laboris. Um, assuming that the synod on synodality is, in some sense, a desire to make the church less centralized in Rome, a little more diffuse, more power to Episcopal conferences, and so on. Um, do you think the instrument of laboris gives us a, a proper idea as to what it means by synodality? Did you discover, I didn't really ever discover in the text, still, yet, three years into this process, what, what the Vatican really means by synodality. Maybe you can enlighten me a bit. Well, I think I do more. I mean, I've come to appreciate that what it's asking for is a wider kind of interaction. You know, there's there's there are those passages where it talks about a church that's less bureaucratic and more relational. Yes, and I think that that that's fine. And and again, as I said earlier, if if JP two or, or Benedict were saying these things, we'd all say, mm, okay, good, let's let's work on that. But it's always that I think that they're talking about bureaucratic, and they mean doctrinal. Because, um, I mean, you, yeah, if you deal with the Vatican, you're always going to find that it's a, it's a pretty clunky bureaucracy when you're trying to get anything done with them. I've dealt with them a great deal. You probably have, too. And that's a problem. But it, I don't think that it, it is something that, that seriously damages the evangelizing mission of the church. A lot of people, you know, there's a phrase in, in the, the instrumentum that says we need to be talking with people and welcome them especially for those who may have felt that they were being threatened or judged by the church. Now, that's not bureaucracy. That's a question of maybe people in office applying the rules. And the rules are there for a reason. They're, we want to be relational. We want to have some, a certain personalism universalized. 
but it has to be a person a christian personalism it has to be a personalism that, that yeah. seeks to imitate christ the person of christ and not just whatever randomness happens to exist with people i mean you 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 evangelize actual people who are living in the problem in the problems that they have but again and again it just seems to me that what is good in synodality, the, the, the larger conversation, the attempt to consult, and even consulting, they, they're worried about that term because it sounds like it's dismissive. And yeah, you, you, you probably read that passage where they say, yeah, yeah. consulting can't simply mean, oh yeah, thank you. And then you go off and make your decision. But actually everybody does that in the church. Bishops do it, the Pope does it, Vatican officials do it. And they have to, because it's an organization that has to be able to run in some at least fundamentally coherent way across every culture, every continent on earth. So look, I get the conversational part, but I think that there are, are more limits to it than they, they think there are. And I, I actually even wrote down one of the things that make me laugh, made me laugh are the three, the, the three really hard identifications that exist in the uh, document, the three sections where they're going to lay out the vision. The first is called relations. Yeah. which is more or less what I just was describing. The next is pathways. Now, I don't know how much different pathways are than relations, but let's assume we're walking and there are pathways. And then finally, is there are places. And they say we shouldn't understand places in a simply spatial way. The places where we encounter people could be the digital world. And Look, that's all fine. But I, I read those sorts of things, and I, I think... You know, I think back to a, of a lot of bad academic thought that uses terms like that. I, I wrote yeah. a column yesterday at the Catholic thing in which I said, if you're if you're miffed about these sorts of terms and you keep asking yourself, where does this fit into the the traditional understanding of the church and of Christianity? And it doesn't seem to have a, a very strong connection to any of it. I think we need not worry about it too much because these things are not the kind of terms that are going to stand the test of time. They, they may have some immediate use for rhetorical purposes, but really, I think we're we're clutching at straws here. There's a, there's a strong intellectual tradition, and it's not simply a deeper vision. It's you know, it's a big, yeah. wide. It's, it's the greatest cultural, religious, historical tradition right. in in the history of the world, and we're kind of messing around with synodality. Yeah, that was my impression as well. Uh, a mutual friend of ours, uh, I won't mention his name because he, uh, he, I, I don't want to use it without permission, but he, his initial response after he read the instrumentum was that what's good in it has already been said by John Paul and Benedict only better. And what's bad in it is it's over, it's verbosity, but it's overemphasis on what you just said, a, a, a set of buzzwords and buzz ideas if you want if there's such a thing as a buzz idea you know drawn from drawn from a kind of academic discourse that this person doesn't trust <laughs> you know and it just seems utterly superficial and i had to chuckle too as you did when, when it said we want a church that's you know not so bureaucratic and more personalist because i wondered too well what do they mean by bureaucratic uh does it mean doctrine uh, less emphasis on doctrine. Uh, but then I thought the emphasis in the document so much on process and structures and on, is that not an emphasis on bu the bureaucratic in some sense, you know, let's take a look at the structures and the processes and how can we make all of these things more listening? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I think this, this unnamed person is onto something here. You know, there are actually, it creeps out in a couple places in the, in the document that they actually think that this process is going to provide, perhaps I wrote this down, a, a, a um, kind of model for the future of our societies. I, I think they really think that if there's more conversation that goes on within nations, between nations and, and whatnot, we're going to all walk together synodally toward the rosy dawn. This to me, it, it just seems to me to be utter naivete and sentimentalism. That, that yeah, we know yeah. the depth. If, if there's one thing that, that even the secular world can recognize about the Christian belief, it's that this the notion of sin and human evil is a realism. You know, what's going on in, in Israel right now, you could parse it one way or another, or Ukraine, or these wars that go on in Africa, or our own craziness, you know, attempts at assassinations and whatnot. 
But human evil and human error and human folly are pervasive in human life. They're in each of us individually, and they're in society as a whole. And you know, we, you and I go back a long way. I think we're about the same age, and we can remember the enthusiasm and and the you know the, the progressive hopes of Vatican II. And, it, and some yeah. of that is good. There's nothing wrong with, you know, being energized about the future. But we can't, I really think of Catholicism as the realistic religion. We we aspire to what is absolutely high, but we are, and we are really sensitive to what else exists in the world. I wrote in, also in this column yesterday that my friend Michael Novak, the great American theologian yeah. and economic um, theorist, uh, he's, he was Slovak. I'm half Slovak, and, and we run a program in the Slovak Republic every year. And uh, he used to say that the, one of the advantages of having a Slovak grandmother is that when people say, "Well, you know, look, at least things can't get any worse," your grandmother says, "Oh, yes, they can." And that's the old <laughs> that's that's the old human as well as the Catholic wisdom. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you know. And I, I'm glad you brought up to the the, re, the the there is this sort of Pollyanna optimism. This kind of dialogue will cure everything. Can't we all just get along? Sort of superficiality to it all. And what struck me was when you read the document, and like like you, I've read it multiple times now. Where is the mention of sin, redemption, the economy of salvation, uh, the, the reality of human evil? Uh, uh, the church needs to deal with. It. I mean. It's absent, isn't it? I mean, very, very little discussion, if at all, in there. Of the central, the central missionary focus of the church is repent and believe the good news. Where is the emphasis on conversion, repentance, sin, evil, those sorts of things? I don't see it in there. Yeah, it, it's like there there was a prior uh, veto of mentioning any of that stuff. You remember, but during Vatican II, they yeah. weren't allowed to talk about communism. Pope asked them not to. They said, "There's communism. It's not mentioned and here." In the 1960s, you had a, a enormously powerfully armed Soviet Union that was persecuting Christians in, in within the, uh, Russia, but also within Eastern Europe, and and several hierarchs were involved in that persecution, and yet we couldn't talk about communism. And similarly here, I think that there's su such a, a emphasis on on uh, us all walking together. That there's a, a playing down of you know this the stone in my shoe and the unevenness of the pavement and you know there there are robbers yeah. down the way who might jump us and so there is a there is that kind of um, I don't know if it's Pollyannish but it certainly is a willed blindness to what is actually out there to the point I when I, when I just reread it again before we came on the camera um, when they talk about the digital place you know the third category of places. That you have to meet people online and whatnot. Okay, that that's all fine, but I would have expected at least a couple of words about the serious difficulties that now exist in the world because of the the worldwide net pornography. I mean, it's oh like, yeah, you know, yeah, they, they, it, this that... stuff doesn't exist as as far as these documents concerned. And I don't know that it's that they're talked about in those. The, those discussions in the spirit either that they, they, they claim to be talking about so look there's a it's like what you're saying there's a there's a whole world that seems to be outside this um this circle of synodality that it, it can't help but make you worried because you know that that those are the things that you're engaged in, in your job in your community your children at their schools uh in in national and international politics, all that seems to be um, absent. Yeah, and, and absent to the, the necessity of, of grace via the, you know, the sacraments. Emphasis. I mean, the sacraments are talked about, but always so much in the sense of uh, relationality, communion, inclusion, uh, and, and not so much about, and, and I think this is important, uh, not so much about ontological change. That th th there is no emphasis in this papacy in general, or in this document, or in the, the synodal participants, none, uh, on on a theme that does run through the Second Vatican Council, uh, which is that the Christian undergoes an ontological change, which makes the moral regeneration possible, which is why we engage in 
our participation in the sacraments, because the sacraments effect this ontological change within us. But this emphasis that has always been in the church on the necessity of a metanoia, a conversio, an ontological change within us, is absent. And in its place is simply an emphasis on relation and dialogue, ad nauseum, um, which to me is a huge red flag. Yeah, the, 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 the only sin, and it, of course, isn't ca called that. The, the implication is that excluding anyone, um, applying doctrine and moral principles um, uh, vigorously, um, failure to engage in a dialogue, um, somebody making a decision without a wide consulting with other people, all those things, w which I, I think have come in a distorted fashion, even in our secular democracies, to dominate the way we talk about things, those seem to, those seem to be the things that are most worrisome, that, that there are barriers that need to be broken down. Well, I often like to say there's a reason, why, there's an old Chestertonian point, you can't tear down the fence until you understand why people put it up. Because, you know, maybe it's trying to keep the sheep in the pen, or maybe it's trying to keep the yeah. robbers out, or but anyway, there was a reason. People just don't just go around building fences because they have nothing better to do. And you don't go around building even uh, national borders because you don't have anything better to do. That they exist there so that there can be a reasonable, um, realistic, and orderly way of dealing with this mess that often is human life. And yet they don't seem to, to be aware of, of this. It's, it's as if um, from the dawn of time, the only thing that has kept us from... from uh, the age of the spirit is is a, a lack of dialogue i just yeah. I, I, I don't yeah. understand how an, any adult let alone uh, higher up people in the church can lean so heavily not exclusively but lean very heavily on that i'm reminded uh, i agree completely uh it's it's kind of almost to the point where it's it's in, in, incomprehensible but I don't know if you're familiar, just, my, my memory was just jogged. I read an interesting article last week. It was published in Rorate Chely, uh, written by a German, but I think anonymous. And they just put it as an, it was an analysis of this papacy. Uh, and it was very theological. It was long and it was not a polemic at all. It was a dissection of this papacy and the synod and synodality and this emphasis and dialogue. And I'll, I'll cut to the chase here, which essentially his point is that this papacy is, is it goes back to Fratelli Tutti. This papacy really is focused on a kind of globalist narrative uh, and that this globalist narrative is the engine that drives everything. Uh, and their desire is to recast the church as simply a participant within the global solidarity of human fraternity, which is precisely why we need to de-emphasize doctrine and the rough edges of our moral theology and so on. In order, uh, I hate to use a cliche, to position the church as almost like an NGO in the world, as a philanthropic organization for brother. Uh, I, I thought that was actually, there were parts of the article I didn't like, uh, towards the end, it's, it kind of blames John Paul and Benedict for the same thing, uh, uh, which I disagreed with. But what, do, you, do you think there's some cogency in that analysis? Yeah, I read that article myself. And, and oh, I good, say, good. Yeah, I have to say the first half of it kind of um, cleared up a couple of my own confusions that there actually is beneath what looks incoherent, there is actually a coherent um program of, of some kind i'm not saying that it, it works out uh, always or that it, it's maintained consistently but i thought that part of it was rather good and whether he has every detail exactly right or not but we we just know that we're in this situation where the the enlightenment can i kind of get a little deep historically here but the, the enlightenment view of this kind of rational materialism leading to a, a wondrous life for all human beings. It's 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 been fulfilled in terms of material welfare, but in terms of whether it can hold societies together and it can keep people from running off the rails psychologically, morally, etc. I think we've now seen that that thing has come a cropper, 
And so we've got, on the one hand, the Christian tradition, and more broadly, the biblical tradition, including Judaism, that really brought to the fore the idea of the dignity of all human beings, the sanctity of human life, um, a, a certain understanding of freedom under God. You've got that and all the meaning that for, for human life and for human societies that that brings with it on the one hand. And then on the other hand, you have this cold interstellar rationality. So when the Pope talks against those clear and distinct ideas, I'll, I'll cut him a little slack about that. But that's the battle that we're in right now. And we kind of see it. It's a little simplistic, I understand, to put it this way. But you kind of see it in the way that Republicans and Democrats are cl clashing in the United States right now. I mean, there are rationalist elements in the Republicans. There are Christian elements in the Democrats. But by and large, you know, just as, as yeah. two sides uh, coming together, there seems to be this evacuation of meaning on one hand. And then um, the, 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 we, we know we have this residual idea of human meaning and human community. But how do you how do you put these two things together unless you're going to address uh, and and I have to say in, all, in 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 all fairness, Francis has occasionally noted that problem. But the way that you solve the lack of meaning is by evangelizing and telling people, look, the only I, I've argued people with people sec, in the secular world here in Washington for many years about this. If you're not going to say that men have been endowed by their Creator with with rights, that that we are worthy of dignity and respect because we are made in the image and likeness of God. On what basis do you, do you actually have an argument about why I have dignity and why I should have liberty? And we can have a kind of utilitarian, you know, let's live and let live, yeah. but that's a very different thing. And it doesn't solve the problem of a lack of meaning in human life. And that's why we see all sorts of strange monstrous you know bursting out in people's psyches and in society as a whole so that's the struggle it seems to me and i don't think synodality is within a hundred miles of dealing with that problem which is the central issue of our time yeah it is the the uh was my friend mike hanby and quoting the canadian george parker grants it says we live in the a monism of meaninglessness uh, that this dominates our culture, a monism of meaninglessness. And it is the, it is the crisis of our time. And nothing about synodality and all this sort of thing addresses that. Uh, endless dialogue. And so, no, uh, it goes back to what you said before, Bob, about young people, that they want to be instructed. And the reason why they want to be instructed is because they want meaning. They're thirsting after something bigger in life than just themselves, and, and the pornified culture in which they live, and they turn to the church because they see the church has something that maybe can help them in that regard, and they get instead, we're listening to you now. We're listening. Um, so, yeah. yeah. You know, I quoted in, in a, a deep revision toward the beginning, I quoted of all people, Carl Rahner, who once said that the church cannot simply be an, a, uh, an endless debating society. <laughs> Of all people, Ronner. Yeah. So there, yeah. I mean, there are some very interesting things in Carl Ronner, which, you, you, as you know, you've read the book I, I, I talk about. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Of all, of all people said, you know, the church has got to, at certain points, has to make certain decisions. And there's there, there's no um, talking your way around those decisions. Those decisions are really going to have to be made. And, you know, either LGBT activity is OK or it's not. I mean, there, there are simply these binary places. Either male and female, he made them, or they're not. And we've got plenty of people in the church. I, I actually saw a few months ago some uh, some uh, prominent person in the world of biblical scholarship said we shouldn't lean too heavily on male and female. He created them in the current discussions about LGBT plus. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna just say I, I'm just simple minded. I, I think we belong to a binary church, whatever the scripture scholars may say. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, that's that's funny. I'm reminded too. You brought up Carl Rudd. This is the total off the top. I was reading Louis Bouillet's memoirs, and then there's, he recounts a famous story where he was sitting in some meeting during the council subcommittee of the subcommittee of something, and he was sitting next to Ratzinger, and Carl Rahner was standing up and giving a, a, a little speech about dialogue, to which Ratzinger leaned over to Bouillet and whispered. Oh, great. Another monologue about dialogue. 
<laughs> and uh, like I said, totally off topic, but uh, that your, your mention of runner brought that brought that to mind. I do want to bring up though, uh, when we want to talk about what we're about, oh, we're at just, we've been out a while. Uh, I want to talk about one related thing to synodality. To, uh, I wrote an article in Catholic world report not long ago. And it, and, and I got some sort of flack, some kickback from actually people that I, I know and, 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 and like very much who didn't like my article uh, to which I said, Let's be careful not to throw with all this talk about decentralizing the papacy and synodality. Let's be careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater here. There are reasons why a, a strong centralized papacy arose in the church in the first place. And that was, in a sense, to fight off the, the, the forces in the world that were threatening to tear the church apart in, in all kinds of different directions. Uh, and yeah, it's it's the papacy is bloated. It's over it, ultra Montanism. I'm not arguing for ultra Montanism or uh, the Pope to be seen as an oracle on the Tiber, you know, Oracle of Delphi. No, no, none of all of those criticisms are valid. But we also need a strong central papal authority. We do in order to do we really want to look like the Anglicans? Do we really want to look like the Eastern Orthodox who couldn't even hold a pan Orthodox council yeah. five years ago because the Russians picked up their marbles and went home? I mean, is that the goal that, that we're seeking after in the document that came out in ecumenism not too long ago from Rome? They, they kept talking about, oh, we need to learn from the East. We need to learn from the East and even the Anglicans learn what exactly? So I, I, I'm curious as to what your thoughts uh, a little bit as we end this segment here on synodality. What are your thoughts on the value, actually, of a strong? Do you agree with me that we need a strong papal authority in the church, even if that comes with a certain downside? Yes, absolutely. I mean, ultimately, there has to be if there isn't an authority that can tell us what. Um, what the church believes, and I don't think that necessarily uh, a strong central authority um, negates a proper subsidiarity. I, I think actually yes. both, both are, ne are needed. Simultaneously. That was the point of my article. The article was on subsidiarity. I remember that article of yours. I thought it was very good, actually. Uh, but look, we, we're going to discuss this, you know, in what form. John Paul II brought up the question years ago, um, you know, what, what is the Petrine ministry in, in this day and age? And I, I always got the impression that people want a definition of, you know, X is for the papacy, Y is for the bishops. And in canon law, maybe there's some, um, there, there are many places where that needs to be specified. But I think it's also the case that there has to be a certain dynamism between the center and the peripheries. And the, the Holy Father started a conversation about this, but like much else, we, 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 are worried enough about the way the conversation started and seems to be going that we don't want to lose that baby with the bathwater. We we really do need to continue. You know, we all know that Vatican I seemed to emphasize the, the authority of the papacy too much. Vatican II tried to balance things back with, you know, the, the proper role of the individual bishops. But we still need a further conversation, it seems to me. And, and maybe we just have to get past this immediate controversy that we're in right now um, and history will help us to work this thing out and we'll be in a different place. But um, no, I think you're, I think th th that's right. But both a, a strong central authority and um, a proper uh, subsidiarity have to be in a, a, a dynamism with one another. We, we can't just th think that yeah. if we were to get another Pope like John Paul II or Benedict back, that it would solve all the problems. It would not. They didn't solve all, all of them either. No, it's true. They didn't. Uh, and, and it's an ongoing conversation we need to have. Hey, let's shift gears. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, liturgy, uh, because this is, you know, give or take a few days, the third anniversary of the promulgation of the Moda Proprio Traditiones Custodes. And then, of course, there's all kinds of rumors floating around right now that the hammer's about to come down on the Latin mass. Uh, there was that petition signed by a bunch of celebrities in the UK begging the Pope not to ban the TLM. There's similar efforts now. I was asked to sign something here in the United States along those lines, uh, and I did. Um, and I don't want to play in the rumor mill, as I said to you off camera, because it may never happen. Uh, but what do you, what do you, what do you, th I, I know that you probably disagree with Traditiones Custodes, 
Um, but what I'm asked, what is the motivation behind? In other words, why out of a papacy that is constantly talking about totos, totos, everyone, everyone, inclusion, perhesia, speak your mind, synodality, but you not you people, not this mass telling local bit and a synodal church. How do you tell local bishops what parishes can have a TLM, what parishes can't? It seems to me that's a contradiction. Well, I wish I had some uh, some solid insight into what's going on with this. The only thing that occurs to me, because the numbers aren't huge, that's one of the actually yeah. one of the things that was said to Cardinal Mueller in putting down the Latin Mass that he did at the end of the Shard Pilgrimage. This, and then the same is true of this recent. Um, directive not to hold a traditional Latin mass at the end of this pilgrimage that ends in Covadonga in Spain. Spain. Yeah. Now, if it does come down, if this further restriction on the Latin mass does come down, and I think we already have a very, very severe restriction um, on that mass. To me, it says something like this. You can talk about how some of the people who are committed to the Latin mass come darn close to schismat to being schismatics and i've yes. met them you've met them you know they're yeah. people like this okay they're there but they're you know they're they're hotheads in every quarter of the church and so on that's just one, one part of it my suspicion and it's only a suspicion is that somebody in rome maybe several somebodies in rome look at the energy the devotion the vocations, the number of young families that seem to be going to these Latin masses. And they fear something about it. They fear that there's something powerful going on there that they don't like. Now, you and I could speculate that they don't, they, they're, they, they're fearful that we're going to go back to pre-Vatican II or they're going to deny the Second Vatican Council. Or, you know, whatever it might be. But you certainly... If this was a small movement that just had a you know had its life among a couple hundred thousand people around the world, whatever it is, I don't think the Vatican has to go out of its way and then earn the the dislike of so many people, even those who don't attend the, the traditional Latin mass. I, I don't think they would do this unless there was they felt there was something that they had to simply stamp out. And so, Whatever that is, and whoever it is that feels that way, I don't know. I don't know what they're going to do. I've heard the, the rumors like you and our, our mutual friend, Diane Montagna, who is um, located in Rome and is generally a very reliable reporter about what's going yes. on. In yes. She has said that the document is written. She had it from she what she thought was a reliable source. Other people have denied it. Um, I think that the original date for it to appear was tomorrow it was set july 17th yes that's what i read too yeah um but we'll see uh, but i i think that in addition to being upset because i am upset about this if, if this is stamped out i don't think that this is right i signed that that petition as well i thought we should have had a smaller group of people um somewhat like the uk group that was a, a more of a cultural thing that so it didn't create a kind of an intra church uh, dynamic yeah. but look i signed it too and the reason is um there's something wrong with this there's there's something that just doesn't feel right about this need to uh, sequester the mass of the ages uh, unless you feel that the history of the church is almost entirely an error i, I think we have to let that shine through and certainly benedict's idea um, in um, Sorum Pontificum was that there would be a mutual enrichment, that the past and the present and the future would benefit by interacting with one another. And, and I think a lot of parishes, that was the case. So yeah. anyway, I'm speculating, you know, I could speculate a long time. Yeah. But at the end, I, I have to think there's something that they fear that is powerful and, and spiritual in a way that... Um, yeah, that they don't, they don't want to I, see. Them to they don't want to see. I mean, I think a couple of things. First, you're right. The, the 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 interesting thing is that the number of people associated with the Latin mass movement is minuscule vis-a-vis -vis 
the broader church. Uh, so why is Rome so fixated on such an insignificant small population of, of Catholics who don't really have a broader influence, unless Rome thinks they do have a broader influence? And I'm wondering if the broader influence they're worried about are young seminarians and young priests. Uh, they don't want seminarians and young priests saying the old Latin mass. And there is, I mean, just the New York times ran an article yeah. a few days ago. And I know from time, I'm sure you do too, talking to seminary formators, seminary rectors. My wife is Dean at a seminary St. Charles in Philadelphia. Uh, yeah, young seminarians have a certain, a certain traditionalist sort of, they're, they're not Sades, they're not, you know, fans of Vigano or anything like that, but they have a certain love for these older forms of liturgy. Uh, there's no, and I'm, I'm wondering if that's not ultimately more the target. Let's just, let's just nip this in the bud so that the next generation of priests isn't anyway that's just pure speculation on my part no well i i think that could be certainly could be part of it because the uh, you know if you think about people who become priests these days you probably know this better than i do um there, there's not the old prestige that there used to be there's certainly within no. catholicism there is a, a respect and the love of, actually for a good priest but um you know you don't have the the general secular social uh, status that you once had. In fact, au contraire, as the French said, you, had the, you have a, a lot of dislike and, and fear and uh, and uh, unjustified criticism of priests as, as if they were all abusers somehow. So yeah. if you're going to become a priest these days, why are you going to do it? You're not going to do it to become a social worker. You can become a social worker. You're not going to do it because um, somehow it's going to give you a position in the community. What are you going to do? Because you care about Jesus Christ and you care about the church and you think that 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 is an important thing to exist in the world, in your family, in your community, and 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 beyond, and try to redeem the world. Other than that, there there are other there are other uh, vocations you can pursue for for other ends. And I don't know, I, I don't have a, a grip on the worldwide um, situation of priests. But we talked about Africa earlier, and certainly there are, there are a lot of vocations in Africa, Asia. They aren't hurting for vocations the way Europe is. We're in a little bit better situation. And the um, seminarians that we have, of course, are really, say, I, I really think are top notch, the ones that I Yeah, have. they are. They're excellent. Uh, yeah. So look, uh, maybe it's partly that, but I don't think you can put a cork in that bottle. I think it, once this yeah. papacy goes by, if, if a number of parts of the world seem to have priests who would like to be able to celebrate the Latin mass, maybe not always in the parish, but you know, in my yeah. own parish, which is very good, we, we used to have it once a week, but now it's, that's gone too. Yeah. Yeah. And in full disclosure, I am not a huge fan of, of the old Latin mass. I do not attend. I, I attend an Anglican ordinary parish because I do like high liturgy. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm not. So I'm not saying this out of some sort of vested interest in having the Latin mass everywhere because it's, I don't have a particular attachment to it one way or the other. But one last thing. I mean, uh, I don't know if you read the Jade Hendricks substack, uh, What We Need Now, but there was an article that in that substack that came out yesterday, which is a synopsis of a new book that's coming out. Uh, Stephen Bullivant, who I've had on this show. Uh, do you know Stephen Bullivant at all? He's a I know scholar. his work. I, I don't know him personally. Yeah. And, you know, does a lot of sociological data. He, he wrote a book called Nuns, N-O-N-E-S, which we talked about on this show. Uh, about sociological reasons why people leave religion. Well, he and a co-author whose name, I apologize, I can't remember, uh, are coming out with a new book on the traditional, on, on those people. It's a study of those people who attend traditional Latin masses. And uh, the conclusions that he reached, they were very brief in the Substack essay. I don't know if you read it or not. Uh, but one of them is that this caricature of the average Latin mass goer as a sort of pitchfork brigade, mini me torquemada, semi sede vacante. I mean, that this is simply false. A, a pipe smoker. That, you know, like... Yeah, a pipe smoker, <laughs> men with beards. Uh, every family has 18 kids. I mean, the, the, this is a gross mischaracterization of, of the average Latin mass goer. I don't know if you read the essay or not, but. Uh, 
I, I saw it. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. It's very good. Um, our friend Chris Ziltieri posted it in, on, on Facebook and I was reading it this morning. I thought, wow, this uh, this this is something. And in my last art, I had an article in the register on. I think it was on Sacrosanctum Concilium. No, that's coming up. Uh, something else. But anyway, I, I made mention of the fact that oh, it was on Traditiones Custodes, my article in the register. And I made mention of the fact that there is this caricature out there. But I said, I don't know. I don't have the data to prove one way or the other whether the caricature is true. My my data is all anecdotal and subjective. And that's why I bring up this this new book coming out by Steve Boulevard, the co-author. Because I think it's I think it's important that the Vatican is going to suppress something for reasons of ecclesial unity or whatever, then it should be done based on empirical data you know, and research, not just somebody's ideological thing in the Vatican. If you ask yeah, me. And it's, it's certainly not synodal, is it? To just kind of from on high no. uh, squash what seems to be. I mean, I think it's very dynamic, but it doesn't seem to be, as you say, a very large part of the church. You know, I wrote a column the other day in which I quoted C.S. Lewis, um, who back in the 60s, just before he died, I think in his last book, um, was worried about some changes that the Anglicans were made, making to their own literature. Now, we can imagine that compared to what we've seen since Vatican II, these were quite minimal <laughs> changes. He, I think they were getting rid of some archaisms and, you know, who knows if that was a good idea or not. But Lewis says about this, he says, uh, take care. Because one of the easiest things in the world is to break eggs without making omelets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so true. <laughs> so true. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's one of my issues with so many things going on in the contemporary church. That's a great way maybe to end this, uh, that it's very easy to break eggs without making an omelet. And there's a lot of egg breaking going on today. But the question is, is is what's the reason? Are we getting are we getting an omelet or are we just getting a We're pile in the frying of pan? I know that. That's all I guess. Yeah, we are in the frying pan. Anyway. Well, anyway, uh, let's we sh I guess we should wrap this up. I th Hey, thanks for coming on the show today. It was great. I, having my, you. my pleasure, Larry. I mean, you, you, you pushed my book. And let me just say that I, every time I see that you've written something, I eagerly go to it because I, I, I think that not only are you insightful, but also um, the, the clarity, the cleverness and the, the, just the, uh, the kind of spirit in which you write it it encourages me that i'm not crazy and probably a lot of other people feel <laughs> i that. think that's why some of my stuff is go i i marvel all the time you know it's like at a hundred thousand views or whatever and i think my little old garbage what the heck are people thinking i think it's for that reason people read it and they say i'm not crazy yeah. <laughs> I'm and not listen we, we should not grow weary in, in doing this stuff it's hard to stay at it I, as i well know but uh yeah. Stay it at is. it. We, we all love the stuff you're doing. Well, oh, well, thank you for those kind words. Thank you. Do you have any last words you want to leave the viewers before we sign no, off? Look, it's look, it's it's Jesus's church. And um, we've had periods in the past. I know that this isn't much of a consolation, but we've had periods in the past where um, even evil popes, let alone yeah. perhaps yeah. perfect popes, have come to power. And and the church has been at yeah. sea sometimes with sometimes without a papacy for more than, than a, a year. Oh, or two. yeah. Yeah. So, in you know, if one of the things about belonging to a church with a long history that's really survived a lot of possible challenges is to recall that it's God's church and He keeps it in, in, in existence. And if I can end with another slightly light-hearted comment, sure. I always go back to Ezra Pound, who was not a Catholic but was a great American modern modernist poet, once said about the Catholic Church that any institution that could survive the picturesqueness of the Borgias has a certain native resilience to it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a great quote. What a great well, quote. And, let and us, it is, let it us is good. walk together, hopefully. Yes. And I'm reminded to the, the prayer that, of Pope St. John the 23rd before he went to bed at night. His prayer was, Lord, it's your church. I'm going to sleep now. <laughs> So uh, that maybe maybe that's the best way to end this. Thanks again, uh, Bob, okay, for, com for, com for coming on the show today. Thank you so much. And thanks, right. everyone, for listening. Bye See now. You.